Hey, welcome to Taylor's Trick Taking Table. I'm Table, and I don't know much about Vikings. I try to do a Viking hairstyle. I'm pretty sure this is nothing. This isn't a thing at all. This doesn't make any sense. In fact, the only game I have that is Viking related is lame thunder and lightning, just like the lamest. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. You're not lame, I love you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I will give you to you, I will give you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, uh, the game we'll be covering today is Herloff. And it's a game designed by, I hope I'm saying this right, Alexander Niepkins and Inge von Dasselar. And it's a two-player only game where the hook is you're trying to bid and get a certain amount of tricks. But some wacky things can happen because some of the cards have powers on them and do wild things in the game. Let's go to the table and I'll show you how to play. The deck in Herloff is made up of four suits numbered one through nine. There's also three Hagalaz cards and three Volknut cards. Here we have the game set up for the only two players. Each player will get 15 cards and then 12 will be set aside. Then you would flip over the top card. This will denote what the trump color is for this round. If it's one of those special cards, like the N or the Volknut, then there will be no trump for that round. Each player will also get this card overview, which will explain some of the specialness of certain cards. Then players will bid on how many tricks they think they're going to win for the round. Enlarged over here, you see the sheet that each player will get. They'll bid for the current round how many tricks. There's 15 cards, so a potential of 15 tricks. Probably won't happen, though. And then, after each player has done that, they keep it secret from the other player. They put it away, and then they start playing tricks. The start player is the person who wasn't the dealer. So let's say it's green bow tie. Looking at their hand, they have some trump here. Maybe they bid six tricks. After they write that down, then they would lead to the trick. And as you can see on the cards here, some of them don't have symbol underneath the number, and some of them do. And it's the same symbol on all the cards. And all it means is that this card is special. And what special cards do, and I'll put it on the side here, is one, two, about six, six of the cards here have special abilities. And I'll lead the trick to show the nine's special ability, because I think it's pretty simple. So when you play to the trick, it's a must follow game. So coming to the edge of sketch here, they have to play green, or they can always play one of the two special cards, the N or the Volknet, I believe it's called, whenever they want it. So looking at the etch sketches hand, they have one green and they have here. So if they were to play this, what this does is it just abolishes the trick. No one gets it. The person who was leading would then lead again, but maybe they want to save that for later, so they decide to play this five. So the nine beats the five, and green bow tie will take the trick. They just start collecting them here. But the special thing about the nine, as seen here, is the loser of the trick, if the nine wins, will be the leader of the next trick. This is different than usual, where the winner would actually lead the trick in any other situation. Let's play one of the fun ones. So six, what six can do is if you win with the six, then you may steal one card from the opponent. So if Green Bowtie had to follow suit here and they didn't want to play one of their ends, they will lose and then the edge sketch player will draw randomly one of the cards. Say edge sketch took this one. We go into their hand and then they would choose any cards. It could be the one they just got, and they would give it a card back to Bowtie. So afterward, they both have the same number of cards in the hand. Then, since they won with it, they collect the trick and lead the next trick. The other powers are just as interesting. So if you win with a one, you can steal a trick from the other player. So that's often maybe if this is, well, this is Trump, if this was played on an offsuit and they win with it, that's a good way to try to win with a one. And if they do, they would just take that trick. And so they would take the trick for winning and another trick. Maybe if you want to hit your bid or something. And then another fun number is the three. So three, you don't have to win with it. If you just play it at all, you immediately take the top card of the deck, 
look at it, and then you would discard a card from your hand and put it there. So maybe they look at this, it's an N, they really want to keep it. Maybe they'll get rid of this four. The last special cards to explain are the N and, I think they have one, the Volk Nut. So the N is pretty much lower than any other card in the game. It's a great way to slough off. What's interesting though is if you play an N and the other player plays an N, the first one actually loses. So it's, it's, it's close to being the easiest way to slough off, but if you lead with it, you might still win. The other thing that's interesting, this Volknet card, is if it's played into a trick, it completely abolishes the trick. Also, if two of them are played, then a new trump is determined. And you would do this just by flipping over the top card from the deck, and that would be the new trump. After that happens, players will have a certain amount of tricks. You'll see who hit their bid. If you hit your bid, you would get a 10 point bonus in addition to one point per trick that you won. Also, if you get three or four tricks, you would get a five point bonus. So if you had bid four, got the four bid, you would get 10 points for the bonus, four for it being four, plus four points for getting four tricks, which is, I think, the most you can get in a round. After tallying up points, you would shuffle again, re-deal out, and you play until someone hits 50, and then whoever has the most points wins. And that is hair loft. And first, let's get some hair off the top of my head. And I did like it. I think hair loft is interesting in its bidding structure. The fact that you play 15 tricks and you can bid anything from 0 to 15 gives yourself a pretty good range. Honestly, I think the actual bids are probably more like 3 to 8 or 9. I, I, I don't foresee, at least in the games I played, anyone really being able to slough off lower than 2 or 3. I think that's pretty tough. Or even winning more than 9 tricks. Just because out of those 15, a lot of the times, some are getting just blown up. And then sometimes you just win a trick, you know? Because usually you'll bid kind of medium range. And there's instances where your opponent is so close to their bid, they're sloughing a lot. So you're, you're, I'd, be, I'd be very surprised if someone got lower than two <laughs> in their bid. But overall, I think the fact that you can just bid at such a big range is really fun and interesting in this game. I like the powers in the game. I think it takes a little bit to get used to. But once you know what they are and once you know how to handle them and react them to them, you can get used to them. I, when I was first playing, the sixes were winning and my opponent or me were able to take cards from each other and it felt a little too chaotic, a little too wacky, but then you just have to really understand that the sixes are out there or the card, uh, the three, that lets you just draw from the deck and change up your hand. You have to know going into this game that your hand is probably going to change a lot and sometimes it will be out of your control or sometimes you think you're going to win and they just blow up the trick. So you, you definitely have to, with the Trump changing too, you definitely have to be okay with change in this game. It's a big part of it. And I think trying to maneuver around during the hand to hit that bid is a huge part of the game. It's, it's definitely more tactile, even though you have 15 tricks. So it seems like it's a lot to kind of work with. There's the blowing ups and the, 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 um, the ends, which are you know the lowest those can definitely throw wrenches into uh, best laid plants, <laughs> for sure. What's cool about this game is even though your hand can change a lot, you know, you're, you're getting cards pulled from it or you're drawing cards, uh, a hand can be pretty different in terms of the trick play. The scoring was very consistent. A player can get a lot of tricks, you know, eight, nine, 10, and get a good amount of points. And the person who doesn't can get four or three this is assuming they both miss their bid. And with those bonus five from hitting four or three, they'll still be in the running. So we notice that no matter how poorly or well a player did, they usually still got within a few points of the other player who did relatively well. And it was cool how in a game with kind of a lot of flex, the scoring was always consistent. So it was interesting to have a game that felt swingy, but actually wasn't in the scoring. The production is overall pretty good. I think the artwork's fine. The one thing, and this kills me when trick takers do this, is they didn't put the symbol underneath the number. And I know that's because they probably have the special symbol, but it could have gone underneath. 
And in this game, where you have 15 card hands, 15 card hands, you have to display the cards this big, and it's like a huge fan, and you're sorting your hands like this, and it's just, it's so much. Oh, maybe I'm just nitpicking here, but please don't do this in your games. Other than that, good stuff. I also love the zero-sum bidding idea, because if you bid three or four and hit it, you're going to get the five from getting three or four, then the ten for the bonus for hitting your bid. And it's interesting because if you bid three or four, your opponent already doesn't want you to get three or four, because that's bonus anyway. So maybe you bid five, right? Because if they eke you out, because if you're sloughing off, and they eke you out just above four, they think you're safe, so you bid five. And it's super fun to do that and, and, and kind of trick your opponent. And maybe they know that's what you're going for, so they push you to six, and then you bid six. There's such a good kind of like mental situation here. Last video was Jekyll and Hyde, where you can kind of maybe slough off a little bit and then win a bunch to kind of trick your opponent into what your bid is and what you're going for and really get into the head of them. And this game has that kind of mental aspect. And I think in a two-player game, you really want that meta right. So it's, it's a cool component of this game. The card play itself, I think, is, is good. It's more interesting to look at the game from the bidding and trying to hit the bid perspective. I think the card play is kind of just okay. Um, getting a lot of the ends and the, uh, the abolish the trick cards just feels a little powerful. I know we played where one of us would only get one or two and the other person would get a bunch and it felt just like, oh, okay, you know? And I, I think part of the game is you're pulling cards from their hand and trying to get that. And part of it is getting it from the top of the deck. But it's all a little random, so trying to hit such a specific bid out of 15 can be tough when it is just a bit random. So that is Herloff, and I like this game. If you like cards with special powers and bidding, I think you'll find this interesting. Personally, I think Fox in the Forest, or what we recently covered, Jekyll vs. Hyde, probably does cards with special powers to my liking a little bit more, but this, I think, does a good job at both bidding and cards with special powers. So definitely check this out if that sounds interesting to you. But anyway, thanks so much for watching.